Hello, I'm Richard Gilroy from Intermountain Healthcare, and I'm here with Donna Cryer from the Global Liver Institute. We're present here at the NASHTAG meeting, and firstly, I'd like to ask you, you're here today, why are you here? It is uh, so exciting to be here at the NASHTAG meeting with a lot of the thought leaders in fatty liver disease and NASH, many of whom I know and have worked with for over 20 years, to uh, get the best and most current information that I can share with patients and patient advocates about what we can do to stop the epidemic of NASH. And your organization specifically it fills a role here. Could you tell us more about it? Because for the people who are listening to this mm -hmm. or viewing this, they may not know exactly what you do with the global organization sure. that you represent. The Global Liver Institute was created four years ago um, on the 20th anniversary of my liver transplant, actually, as I looked out across um, healthcare and saw that there were still so many gaps in the liver space. Um, there wasn't enough urgency or advocacy. Um, there wasn't the general acceptance that liver health and liver patients were truly important. And so GLI, or the Global Liver Institute, um, fills, that, fills that gap. So in filling that gap, Yes. Explain to me more. How does it fill the gap? Sure. Where is the gap as you see right. it? Well, we convene a lot of other organizations within the liver community. There are many uh, places and people who are doing really great work, but um, they go unknown or unnoticed. So we elevate them so that they get more attention, more funding. We also, where we see no or few organizations that currently exist, then we create those organizations. So in the area of NASH, we've created a NASH Council, which not only brings together um, liver patients, NASH patients, and those with fatty liver disease, but starts to bring to the table uh, stakeholders beyond hepatology. So we have the American Heart Association, the Endocrine Society, nursing organizations, who all need to learn more about how NASH affects their patients. So we serve in a, a, a broad convening role in the U.S. and then with our partners overseas. So I Google GLI, I'm a yes. patient. Yes. What am I going to find when I look at your website? Well, if you're a patient, particularly if you are advanced in your journey and want to make that transition from patient to patient advocate, we're really the organization for you. So one of the things that we launched in 2017 was an advanced advocacy academy. So many of the organizations, uh, many people, many liver patients who have their own organizations or they've started to say, you know, I've gone through a transplant or NASH treatment or liver cancer treatment and I want to do more what do I do? How do I do it? They come to us and we help uh, equip them with greater skills and advocacy and help support them in their advocacy journey. And the education that you're learning here today yes. you know, on the problem, uh, what can you tell us about fatty liver disease as a problem in the community? Is it easy to find or do most people with the disease not know they have it? Well, it's easy to find if you look for it because it's so prevalent. But most patients, even those who have been diagnosed with NASH, say, well, my doctor said there's just nothing you can do. And that's not true. So first and foremost, for those who are already diagnosed, we want to let them know there are things we can do. And we're working with the thought leaders here to really make it clear and to have a, a communication that we can give to patients and primary care physicians about what can you do now um, before you know, new drug therapies um, come on the market, because there are things that we can do now. So the Global Institute can tell you what you can do now. What are that is, that's what that we're we working on. Um, what are they? So we convened um, uh, the NASH Council, and so out of that are working groups that are determining those things. So in four areas. So how can we help advance public screening and, and knowledge so the general public understands that NASH is epidemic proportions and anybody with a liver should be thinking about this and it should be put in the same type of thinking and conversation and magazines about liver health as it does cardiovascular health or brain health. And then we talk about supporting clinician education. So, you know, the people here at the NASH tag meeting are the experts in the field. They know it, they get it, but how can we share it with a primary care doctor in uh, here, you know, here in Utah who is treating these patients but really don't don't know how or don't have the tools, and then how can we support uh, patients who are diagnosed, and finally, what are the policies, because I'm from Washington, D.C., so what are the policies that are necessary to support the success of the things coming out of those three work groups? Well, one of the things you raised, which is really important, is you said doctors who are treating these patients, but I suspect there's a lot of doctors, because they don't know, who aren't treating these patients. Yes. Now, what treatments are you specifically advising? We talk about you know, Mediterranean diets and mm -hmm. coffee and avocado consumption and a new balance and weight loss. 
Are there any other things that you've learned from the council right. meetings to date that may be of benefit for these people? Well, looking at the ASLD diet guidelines that do exist, there are things like vitamin E, and they've talked about some of the trials here that have shown the effectiveness of that, or pioglitazone. Um, but what's emerged in the conversations, both officially um, on the podium, but also in the conversations at this meeting, are there are a lot of things, like those that you have just mentioned, that aren't necessarily getting out in a clear and cohesive way with medical endorsement. So we don't want patients um, or even primary care doctors to be just you know, going on the internet, and there are lots of you know, uh, unsettling and untrue information, misleading information about lifestyle, diet, obesity. We want to be able to create out of the conversations and information at this meeting and working with the people who are participating here to come up with a good set of medically endorsed things that people can do, lifestyle changes that we can do until uh, some uh, drug therapies come along. You know, it's interesting when you talk about the uh, therapies that you can find on the internet, there was one I remember reading called liver cleanse which was an interesting bottle mm -hmm. because one of the components of it is a, 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 a natural herb called black cohosh, mm -hmm. which has been associated with uh, fulminant liver failure. Yes. So you may take something to cleanse your liver and it might cleanse it completely away, so you need a new one. Liver transplant is the domain that I'm in. Mm -hmm. It's the domain that you yes. have particular familiarity. Can you tell me a little bit about your story that occurred there, if that's all right. That came no, that, that's, that's fine. I'm very proud. I feel very privileged and blessed to, to share it. Um, I was, uh, I originally had um, ulcerative colitis, a type of inflammatory bowel disease that was diagnosed when I was in eighth grade. And then it progressed as it does in about 10% of patients into a, um, a bile duct, a biliary disease um, affecting the bile ducts leading into the liver um, called primary sclerosing cholangitis. And, um, you know, always being in that top percentile, I developed uh, liver, liver disease out of that to the point where I needed a transplant. And by the time I was uh, no longer in eighth grade, I was in law school by that point. Um, I was told that I had seven days to live. I was in intensive care and going through multi-organ system failure. I had already had my colon removed and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really just thanks to medical innovation and to the dedication of, of physicians like yourself that I'm able to stand here today and to work on behalf of other patients. Well, the other part about that is the most critical part. You can get rid of all of us. If you don't have a donor, there's no chance that we keep you alive. So you're a beneficiary of so many things. Absolutely. Um, you know, when you have a look at your disease uh, and transplantation, the hard part is that if you think of true statistics, we'll put 13,000 on the list. Right. This year, uh, we will do about 8,100 transplants. Due to the benefit of a heroin epidemic, we had mm -hmm. a dramatic spike in recent times in donors. But the part that I struggle with is always is that there's that gap that you talked about before yes. between the number of donors we have and the number of people that we have waiting. Are you, uh, with the GLI Foundation, filling a gap there about donor adv advocacy right. and those elements? We absolutely are. So uh, through social media, um, on one end, we have Transplant Tuesdays, where we celebrate transplant stories um, and honor organ donors so that people understand that this is really a miracle and this is something they can do, but something they need to discuss with their families and be proactive about planning. Mm -hmm. And then on the more formal end, we are uh, in the process of creating patient versions of the long-term management um, guidelines. So, you know, for, for people who are lucky enough to be uh, post-transplant 5, 10, 15, 20 years, what are my risks you know, for cardiovascular disease, which frankly I'm more likely to die from than a, a liver-related event at this point. So how do you make sure that that great gift of life is maximized for the life of the recipient? So we're working to create um, simple versions that it, once again, uh, patients and primary care physicians can, can know how to optimize you know, the, the life and uh, help liver transplant recipients thrive. And sort of creating a patient-centered version of centers of excellence. We know that payers often make those designations, but to this point so far, patients haven't really weighed in on what criteria that we look for in not only the transplant center during the immediate 
physician, but our transplant care long term. Well, that's an interesting interface, and uh, because it's one of the gaps. Even transplant yes. centers themselves may transplant someone, and then at one year they send them back to their primary care yes. physician to be managed. And the primary care physician pulls up the uh, yeah. the information on the medication that yeah. says atorvastatin. If you have liver problems, please consult your doctor. And they sit there, well, hang on, that's not my area of mm -hmm. expertise. And even liver doctors have yeah. some concern about prescribing statins. Mm -hmm. But you may know, mm -hmm. in the liver studies, when they looked, or at least the statin studies, when they did the registry studies, those people who received a statin who had mildly abnormal mm -hmm. liver enzymes more often had an improvement in liver enzymes than those yes. that didn't. So statins may not be that bad. Mm -hmm. It's what's called an idiosyncratic reaction. Mm -hmm. It's like the bad luck you experienced mm -hmm. where a small number of people who have ulcerative colitis, right. or in your case Crohn's, mm -hmm. develop primary sclerosing cholangitis. Right. And in those people, not all of them progress, mm -hmm. but in those that do, some of them have quite an aggressive course, right. which was you. Right. Which I, I do truly feel for the situation. Mm -hmm. But you identified, you've looked after your kidneys. Yes. You've looked after other things because you've been proactive. And these advocacies, mm -hmm. I would emphasize, are our real solution in a world where mm -hmm. everyone wants the responsibility, at least payment for the responsibility elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And in your case, what you're doing, the bridge that you're providing, right. is actually an essential bridge, which was one I didn't realize before I spoke to you today. So anything we can do at Inner Mountain to help you, we will. Thank um, you. And um, uh, one final point. Okay. Um, when you have a look at the problems in the community today, yes. where do you think the biggest one is for health care and liver health in general? Well, I think one of the things that we must tackle is, is care coordination. Um, so, you know, I have a, a law degree and I'm married to a physician, and it's still hard for me to make sure that I get all the care and the steps that I need, even with as proactive as I am about my own health. And so I think every day about those patients who can't put all the pieces together for themselves and who fall through the, fall through the cracks. And so care coordination is one of the top things I think we need to tackle in healthcare to make sure that patients get not too much care, not too little care, but just the right amount of care to optimize their health. Care coordination. So on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for speaking with us today. Thank you.